Welcome guys. Welcome back to Minko's Corner once again. We're back. That's right. We're back due to popular demand. You know, a lot of people were like, oh, I can't wait to see. Listen guys, I, I promise. Relax. Napoleon's Marshals, right? Uh, first of all, I have to say thank you to everybody who was with me in the uh, in the journey of Napoleon uh, in the whole series. Uh, a lot of likes, all subscribers. Thank you guys, thank you very much. We're 41 now. 41! You know, nine more to go to 50. But, uh, yeah, thank you very much to everybody. And, and yeah, now I'm going to do the marshals. Uh, and I'm going to, you know, start looking around for other series. I've looked at uh, everybody's comments, okay? Our, you know, I have a pretty good uh, idea of where we're going with this. But, anyways, uh, Chapter 1, Napoleon's Marshals, Perignon, Brune, Serrier. Let's go. Terror belly, decus pacis. Terror in war, ornament in peace. Dude, the word. The Marshall's baton is something I want to buy. It looks so cool. A baton? Are you kidding me, man? Words inscribed on every French Marshall's baton. They look awesome. In France, the title of Marshal, or Maréchal, goes back at least to the 13th century. No way. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a Marshal's baton. Why don't generals nowadays have cool things like this? You know, because nowadays generals, they have these, you know, khaki uniforms, you're like, eh, you have four stars instead of three. But if, if, you become a four-star general and start having a baton, dude, the competition would be way higher, man. You walk around, you have a baton, you're like, Shh, sh, sh. dude. The title difficult. was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. Yeah, but, see, so but in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. That year, he picked 18 of France's best generals and made them marshals of the empire. Eight more were created in the years that followed. So 26, the marshals no. outranked everyone in the new empire, apart from Napoleon's family, princes and ministers of state. They came from every background, sons of aristocrats and innkeepers, professional soldiers and those who'd learned on the job, old school republicans and Bonaparte loyalists. The youngest, just half the age of Cahoon, the oldest. 34, man. You know? And though Marshal was a civil title, not strictly a military rank, the men known to the army as Les Gros Bonnets, the Big Hats, were arguably the most extraordinary, diverse, brilliant and flawed group of military commanders in history. The most favoured were showered with titles and wealth. But the price, too, was high. Yeah. Half were wounded, three were killed or died of wounds. Two were executed. This is Epic History TV's Guide to Napoleon's Marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements as Marshals, with expert guidance from retired Lieutenant Colonel Remy Porte, former Chief Historian of the French Army. No First, way, really? a thank you to our sponsor, Call of War. Call of War is a free online PvP strategy game played by millions of users okay. worldwide that gives you... Many were brilliant leaders. A few probably deserved to be marshals, more than some who were. Any selection can only be difficult and highly subjective, but here's our pick of 12 of the best. Okay. Bertrand. Napoleon's faithful aide-de-camp, who commanded 4th Corps at the Battle of Leipzig. He survived the wars. You know? Clausel, a veteran commander of the war in Spain. Okay. Dessay, Napoleon's close friend, killed at Marengo, aged 31. Prince Eugène, Napoleon's adopted son, a hero of the Russian retreat. He was Gerard, a Russian? one of Napoleon's best corps commanders by 1814. Damn, the guy lived long, 52, uh, 27, 52, 15, he lived 79 years, man. 
1850, the Marshal by King Louis Philippe in 1830. Goudon, whose infantry division bore the brunt of the fighting at Auerstedt in 1806, died of wounds near Smolensk in 1812. Hmm. Junot, who first served with Napoleon Dude. at Toulon in 1793, probably committed suicide space, after his fall from favour in 1813. Lasalle, the Hussar general, among the best light cavalry commanders of the Napoleonic Wars, killed at Wagram, aged 34. Hmm. Maison, who told his division on the morning of Leipzig that they must win that day or all be killed, Isn't made marshal by King really? Charles X in 1829. Nonsouti, the heavy cavalry commander who died of wounds and exhaustion, aged 46. Hmm. Saint-Hilaire, hero of Austerlitz, died of wounds received at Aspern in 1809. Van Damme, of whom Napoleon once said, if I had to invade hell, I'd want him commanding the vanguard. Yeah. And now, Napoleon's 26 marshals, ranked in order of merit. Oh, those weren't the marshals, those were like the, you know, the look, you know, the, the people who were, uh, <laughs> who were sort of dismissed. I'm surprised that the stepson of Napoleon, Eugène, wasn't made a marshal, you know? That says something. 26. Marshal Perignon. Okay. When Napoleon created the first 18 marshals, four were honorary marshals, recognized for past service to France. Yeah. Okay. Perignon was one of these. Yeah. A former officer in the Royal Army, he'd won fame in the Revolutionary Wars, fighting the Spanish on the Pyrenees front. He later served as ambassador to Spain. After a brief retirement, he was sent to Italy, and commanded the French left wing at the disastrous Battle of Novi. Mm where the army was routed by Suvorov's Russians, and Perignon was badly wounded and captured. Yeah. His appointment as honorary marshal in 1804 was a political move by Napoleon, a way to win acceptance for his new empire, by also. emphasizing continuity with the revolution, by rewarding its military heroes. Okay. Okay. Perignon never Makes held sense. active command as a marshal, but served as governor of Parma, and later Naples. Yeah, to, to be honest, 100% truthfully, I would have loved, if I was ever made a marshal, yeah. uh, if I was back in the day, that that was my position. Staying at home, you know, being governor of like Naples and Parma, that's fine for me. Go fight your battles. I don't need, you know, I'm not as your marshal. You, you know, you, you, know, you have the rank. I don't need the, 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 the glory. The, go get the glory. Okay, good luck. I'm staying Oops. here. In Napoli, eating, His eldest son, you know, drinking. Pierre, was a cavalry officer, killed at Friedland in 1807. Sucks. Perignon retired in 1813, but okay. refused to support Napoleon when he returned from exile in 1815 uh -huh. and was stripped of his marshal's baton. Yeah. His rank was later restored by King Louis XVIII. Nice, nice. 25. I mean, you know, the, it doesn't surprise me. It just surprised me that he didn't, you know, come uh, fight with Napoleon because they didn't develop that sense of uh, camaraderie. You know, in the sense of they didn't fight in battles. The guy was a governor half a mile, you know, half a continent away. Whereas all the other marshals, you know, they 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 sweated, they fought, they strategized, they won together all these battles. He was just chilling, so there was not uh, th there wasn't that connection. You know? Five. Marshal Broom. Brun was another marshal whose appointment owed much to politics. As a fiery Republican and former close ally of revolutionary leader Georges Danton, his support was politically People back in the day, man, unfortunate fate. useful for Napoleon. Brun joined the army during the Terror, the most extreme period of the revolution. His political connections ensured rapid promotion, and he was sent to help put down a counter-revolutionary revolt in Bordeaux. In 1795, as a 30-year-old brigadier general, he helped Napoleon disperse a royalist mob in Paris with the famous whiff of grapeshot. Brune then served with Napoleon in Italy, fighting in several of his famous early victories. Nice. He won a reputation as a fierce divisional commander, 
and enthusiastic plunderer of Italian towns and churches. Yeah. In 1798, money, 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 money. he commanded the French occupation of Switzerland, while extorting 200,000 francs from the wealthy Swiss communes, the equivalent of several Never mind, that will be me. <laughs> million dollars today. Dude. It was said that Brun's personal carriage was so laden with gold when it left Switzerland that it immediately broke down. Ah! The lovely. next year, he won his most important victory while commanding French forces in Holland, defeating an Anglo-Russian army at the Battle of Castricum, and saving France from invasion. But a short, calamitous... You know, that's enough. You know, you might think, oh my god, the guy's a great piece of shit, he steals the gold, all that. Listen, you save your country from invasion, take all the gold you want. 250,000... Buy yourself a nice chateau and... Spell commanding the army of Italy convinced Napoleon that Brun was not fit for high command. Yeah. Instead, he sent him to be ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, no! where in 1804, he learned that he'd been made a marshal. Those are the positions that you want. You don't want to be in the battlefield. I mean, yeah, it may be more exciting, but a fucking cannonball might come, you know, towards you. No, no. Go to the Ottoman Empire, be an ambassador, be made a general, take all the gold you can, what you can. That's a, that's the life. You know, don't be... But Brune's lack of delicacy, combined with a towering sense of self-importance, uh, did not make him a successful right, diplomat. He was recalled to France, mm. but as governor of the Hanseatic ports, blundered again, <laughs> drafting a treaty with Sweden that failed to make any mention of the French Emperor. Whether a deliberate insult or act of incompetence, Napoleon was furious, and Brune was sacked. Brun spent the next seven years at his country estate. He bitterly opposed the return of the Bourbon monarchy in 1814, and rallied to Napoleon when he returned from exile the next year. That's unexpected. You know, that's really unexpected, because, you, I, you know, that's someone who doesn't hold a grudge, uh, that I feel like, from just the way he was portrayed, because he wouldn't fight for Napoleon, or he hated the, the Bourbons that much. Yeah. But in the tumult following Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, Brune was cornered by a royalist mob in Avignon, murdered and tossed into the River Rhone. 24. Marshal Serrurier. Uh, that's us. Yeah. yeah, to be a general, it doesn't mean you have to be a good Serrurier guy. Serrurier was another of the four honorary marshals whom Napoleon wished to recognise for past service. In contrast to Brun, Serrurier was a professional soldier of the old school, a veteran of the Seven Years' War, and a stern disciplinarian. This background was not necessarily an asset during the French Revolution, when any officer who'd served in the Royal Army was viewed with suspicion. But Colonel Serrurier's training and diligence were soon recognised as assets to the new French Republic. By 1795, he was a general serving with Napoleon in Italy, where his stand against corruption and looting won him the nickname the Virgin of Italy. Okay, so he's basically like the next star. was a reliable, if unspectacular, commander, who the won an important <laughs> victory at Mondovi at a crucial moment in Napoleon's rise to fame. The following year, he accepted the Austrian surrender at the end of the long siege of Mantua. Two years later, fighting under General Moreau's command, Serrurier and his division were cut off by the Russians and forced to surrender. Released on parole, he was back in Paris in time to support Napoleon's coup d'état of 18 Brumaire. Serrurier then retired from active command. But Napoleon, remembering his past service, made him an honorary marshal nice. and governor of Les Invalides, nice, a retirement nice. home and hospital for old soldiers. Is he the one that burns all the the, the, the you know the? Then, yeah. Shortly before the fall okay. of Paris in 1814, Serrurier oversaw the burning of more than a thousand captured flags and standards. Yeah, he's like you're not getting this. Falling into Allied hands. You're not getting this back. It's ours. 23. Marshal Kellerman. That's a, that's a, that's a, a huge compliment. Kellerman was another honorary marshal, 
the oldest at 68, and famed throughout France as the saviour of the revolution. A career soldier from a middle-class background, he had seen distinguished service as a cavalry officer in the Seven Years' War. At the beginning of the Revolutionary Wars, he was a general, commanding a frontier army at the moment of greatest crisis, when mm. it seemed foreign invasion was about to stamp out the revolution and restore the Ancien Régime. But at Valmy, in September 1792, Kellerman's Army of the Centre stood its ground, and with a ferocious artillery barrage, persuaded the Prussian army to withdraw. Nice. Valmy was not a stunning tactical victory, but it was a turning point of history that saved the infant French Republic. Mm. When the revolution took a more radical turn, even a war hero like Kellerman became suspected of royalist links, and spent a year in prison under the threat of the guillotine. That, that, yeah, that's, that's what happens when there's a revolution. You know, you, you, you cast down the, the ancient regime, and then you start going on a on a wide spree of you know who supports secretly the regime that was exiled. Let's kill everybody that has a mild connection. You know that's happened every time a new power takes over. In Cuba, it happened. Uh, in France, it happened. In the Soviet Union, it happened when a new regime comes over, and then they start killing within themselves. It's a whole thing. It's it's ugly. Acquitted and restored to command. He was poised to launch a new offensive in Italy, when he was sidelined, first by General Scherer, then in favour of a rising new talent, General Bonaparte. Kellerman later specialised in army administration and training, a role he continued to perform under Napoleon, whilst also entering politics and serving as President of the Senate. His son, General Francois Etienne Kellerman, followed in his father's footsteps serving as one of Napoleon's best cavalry commanders. 22. Marshal Grouchy His conduct was as, 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 was as unforeseeable as if his army on the march has been struck by an earthquake and swallowed. Failed too much to be laid during the battle world. No when way, Napoleon really? returned from his first exile in 1815, he created one last marshal for the upcoming campaign, A lot of major Emmanuel de Grouchy. Although now infamous for failing to march to Napoleon's aid during the Battle of Waterloo, up to that moment Grouchy had had a long and distinguished military career. An aristocrat who embraced the French Revolution, Grouchy served with distinction throughout the Revolutionary Wars fighting counter-revolutionaries in the Vendée, and serving in Italy, where he was wounded and captured at the Battle of Novi. Under the Empire, Grouchy excelled as commander of a Dragoon division in Marshal Murat's cavalry reserve. He was praised by the Emperor for his part in the great French charge at Eylau, mm, yeah. played an important role buying time for Napoleon at Friedland, and expertly covered the French right wing at Wagram. For the invasion of Russia, he commanded 3rd Cavalry Corps, and was wounded at Borodino. He survived the horrors of the retreat, but was left so exhausted it took him several months to recover. He returned for Napoleon's 1814 campaign in France, and was wounded twice more. Grouchy was made a marshal at the start of the Hundred Days campaign. I mean, the guy deserves it. Like, if there's someone who deserves this, this guy is it. I mean, how many battles was he in? Look, look, look at how many battles. He was wounded twice over. He went to Moscow. He returned. He survived. Napoleon's right wing at Ligny. After the battle was won, he was ordered to pursue the retreating Prussians to prevent them joining up with Wellington's Anglo-Allied army. Two days later, as the Battle of Waterloo raged ten miles to the west, Grouchy made the fateful decision to follow his written orders, rather than march to join Napoleon, and has been widely blamed for the French Emperor's defeat ever since. I mean, can you blame them? You really, I mean, you can say, yeah, you can blame the guy, but he was much more of a, you know, a perfectionist. That's how I see it. He wasn't someone who was, you know, bold. He was like, give me the orders, I'll do what you want me to do, but... 
she's not someone who's going to improvise, you know? Grouchy's vilification is not wholly fair, not yeah, least mean, because Napoleon rarely encouraged his marshals to show initiative, oh. and often flew into rages if they deviated from his written orders. Well, that doesn't help. One blunder obscure the distinguished record of one of the Grand Armies. Yeah, it doesn't. To me, to me, it doesn't. Armee's best cavalry generals. Grouchy fled to America after Napoleon's defeat to escape royalist reprisals, but was pardoned and returned to France in 1820. No way, really. 21. Marshal Monsey. He was an honest man. Oof! That's the worst you can say about a marshal, man. Because... Mon he, 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 what can you say? You can say the guy's a piece of shit. The guy's a great general. Fearless. Proud. Greedy. You say he's an honest man. The guy must suck. Monsey ran away from home to join the army at the age of 15. After 20 years of uneventful service, he'd risen no higher than the rank of captain. But then came the French Revolution. Most French officers were aristocrats, who, if they did not actively oppose the revolution, were nevertheless regarded as politically suspect. The result was that three quarters of them either fled the country or were dismissed from the army. Monsey, a middle-class officer with no strong political views, reaped the benefit with meteoric promotion. By 1794, General Monsey was leading the army of the Western Pyrenees to victory over the Spanish, Never on mind. what was admittedly a relative Never backwater mind. of the Revolutionary Wars. In 1797, he was dismissed for alleged royalist sympathies, but reinstated in time to support Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire. Mm. By his own admission, Monsey was a sensitive officer. Honest, okay. honourable, but lacking a ruthless streak or iron will to succeed. So he's a basically Napoleon a was aware of his limitations as a general, but made him a marshal in 1804, as nice. part of his emphasis on continuity between the Republic and his new empire. Monsey was appointed inspector... That guy's basically just a good guy, you know? I don't know why... You know, inspector General of the Gendarmerie. France's militarized police force, and spent most of the rest of his career commanding reserve troops. He only held one field command again. In light of his victorious record against the Spanish, he was given command of a corps for the 1808 invasion of Spain, yeah, didn't work operating out, huh? in the south of the country with mixed success. Mm. In 1809, he was replaced by General Junot and returned to France. Monsey's finest hour came in the dying days of the Empire, well, leading the National Guard of Paris in a courageous but doomed defence of the French capital. You know, final in 1815, the restored King of France, Louis XVIII, ordered Marshal Monsey to preside at the trial of Marshal Ney for treason. Monsey regarded Ney as a hero for having saved so many French lives in Russia, and refused declaring, if I am not allowed to save my country, nor my own life, then at least I will save my honour. Yeah, the guy that he, After he, a short, he's basically like the best of all. <laughs> short spell in prison, Monsey was allowed to resume his military career, becoming governor of Les Invalides, in which role he presided over the repatriation of Napoleon's remains from St Helena in 1840. Dude, whatever you want to say about Napoleon, the guy's regarded as a hero in France. You know, the guy, you know, fucking destroyed the First Republic, you know? He made an empire, but people love him. And look at this. If that's not, you know, a, a place of honor, look at this. I, I've seen his, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his coffin, and it's insane. It's huge. It's in this cathedral in the Zevadis. At the end of the ceremony, the 86-year-old Marshal Monsey announced, and now, let us go home to die. <laughs> I mean... 20. Marshal Poniatowski. Is he Polish? I think he is Polish. A, no a man of noble character bringing over with honor and reverence. Nice. Prince Józef Poniatowski was yeah. the King of Poland's nephew, Never mind but his that. military career began as a cavalry officer in the Austrian army, even mm. serving as aide-de-camp to Emperor Józef II himself. In 1789, he transferred to the Polish army, 
with the rank of Major General, but could not save Poland from partition by its rapacious neighbours, Russia, Prussia and Austria. By 1795, Poland had vanished from the map, swallowed up by its rivals. After Napoleon's defeat of Prussia in 1806, Poniatowski decided loyal service to the French Emperor was the best way to win Poland's restoration, although he never fully trusted Napoleon's aims. Sombre, serious and brave, Poniatowski proved an able commander of Duchy of Warsaw forces in Napoleon's service. When war broke out with Austria in 1809, while Napoleon advanced on Vienna, Poniatowski waged a brilliant supporting campaign against a larger Austrian army in Galicia. Mm. For the invasion of Russia, he commanded the Polish V Corps. He and his troops distinguished themselves first at Smolensk and again at Borodino, leading the attack on the right wing. I remember this. Yeah. Nice. Poniatowski and his corps performed heroically throughout the campaign, motivated in part by their old animosity towards Russia. But by the end of the retreat, 5th Corps had been virtually destroyed. Oof. Poniatowski remained loyal to Napoleon, even though the disaster in Russia paved the way for the Russian reoccupation of Poland. He rejoined Napoleon in Germany in 1813, and was given command of the Polish 8th Corps. On the eve of the Battle of Leipzig, he was made a marshal by Napoleon, in recognition of his service and to inspire his Polish troops. I mean, you know, that's nice, you know. But it must suck though, you know, he was made a marshal like a day later you die. Well, at least you die as the, you know, the highest marshal. Poniatowski was the only non-Frenchman to receive this honour. That's nice. He and his troops fought with their usual tenacity and skill at Leipzig, holding key villages on the southern front against the Austrian and Prussian onslaught. At the end of the battle, Poniatowski commanded part of the rearguard. But their only oh escape God, route, a bridge over the Elster River, was blown up too soon. Badly wounded, Poniatowski tried to escape by riding his horse across the river. Didn't but he was out. swept from his saddle and drowned. Dude. He had been a marshal for just four days. In the short term, Poniatowski's loyalty to France achieved nothing, as following Napoleon's defeat, Russia occupied Poland for the next century. Mm. But Poniatowski's legend lived on. Nice. A model of Polish patriotism that inspired future generations. He looks a little bit like Augustus. Here, please. Nice. Nice, nice room. 19. Marshal Jourdan. She was a patriot? Better good thing. As a young French private, Jourdan saw combat in Georgia during the American Revolutionary War. But he then caught a fever that led to his discharge and plagued him for the rest of his life. Dude, the fever, when the French it? Revolution began, he was elected captain of his local National Guard unit, fought at the battles of Gemap and Honschauter, and was rapidly promoted to general. In 1794, he made his name defeating coalition forces at the Battle of Fleurus. This was a crucial victory of the Revolutionary War, which handed France control of Belgium for 20 years. It was also notable for the French army's use of balloon reconnaissance, Whoa! the first effective use of an aircraft in military history. That's I didn't know Jourdan that. Jourdan became a prominent politician under the Directory, lending his name to a law that formalised France's policy of mass conscription. Nice. As a committed Republican, Jourdan refused to support Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire, oh, but his okay. fame as the victor of Fleurus was enough to ensure he became a marshal in 1804. Jourdan was on good terms with Napoleon's elder brother, Joseph. Okay, when jo the outfit of Joseph, top notch. I mean, I, I, I think I've already said it in the past video, but dude, all white with red and gold. Joseph became king of Spain in 1808. Jourdan went with him as his military advisor. Nice. But the situation in Spain was beyond Jourdan's <laughs> military skills to solve. 
He faced stubborn resistance from the Spanish and Portuguese, supported by the British, and an equally stubborn refusal to cooperate from other French marshals in Spain, theoretically under Jourdan's command, but who repeatedly ignored his orders and openly questioned his competence. Why? What Marshal Soult in Andalusia was a prime offender, while Marshal Victor's insubordination at the Battle of Talavera contributed directly to the French defeat. Struck by another bout of ill health, Jourdan went home to recover. Two years later he returned to Spain, but at the Battle of Vitoria in 1813, he and King Joseph were outmaneuvered and decisively beaten by Wellington, yeah. leading to the collapse of the Bonapartist Kingdom of Spain. Jourdan never held a major command again, but his 20 years of service and evident patriotism were widely recognised and respected. He was made a peer by Napoleon, a count by Louis XVIII, and died in 1833 while serving as governor of Les Invalides. Perignon, Brun, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Poniatowski, Jourdan. Eight down, 18 to go. Join us for part two, when we'll continue the countdown. Coming soon. Thank you to... So, okay, so my thoughts on the video. I liked it. Very good video, very informative. I won't remember any of it, but yeah. Uh, no, I remember, like, you know, the, some of them. Uh, I have to watch this video, like, in depth, like, a thousand times to remember, because there's so many of them, like, but uh, a few of them, like, uh, stood out to me. Uh, you know, the, uh, the the Marshal, I really forget his name, let's, let's go back and see. Uh, was it Serrurier or, or, or Brun? You know, the one who stole a lot of gold from Switzerland. You know, the guys ended up saving France from invasion, Good for him. There were a few who were more, you know, uh, yeah, governors and all that. Uh, Poniatowski sucks, man. The guy, you know, loyal to the end, ends up dying because of an error of a bridge that blows up. Uh, Jordan, the last one, uh, interesting life. I mean, a lot of them led very interesting lives. Uh, some of them died early. A lot of them survived, actually. That's what surprised me. A lot of them survived after the war for, like, decades after the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, but anyway, uh, I hope you liked my reaction. I hope you liked my thoughts. If you did, subscribe, like, and all that. And I'll see you guys in the next one.